This program is brought to you by Emory University. In 1973, there were very few people in the world that were doing vitrectomy surgery. First, I was captivated by the beauty of the procedure. The illumination of the opaque vitreous as it swirls, as it's being cut and removed, and then the orange illuminated color of the retina as it comes into view, it, it's actually uh, a thing of, of artistic beauty. But more than that, much, much more than that, I was captivated by the idea that we could actually cure people who were blind or who were facing blindness. VitRet surgery was developed to really restore vision in the late uh, 60s and early 70s for the diabetic blind eye. Up until that time, there was no real procedure to restore vision to these diabetic blind eyes. There's a gel inside the eye called vitreous, and when that pulls on blood vessels, they break. When it pulls on retina, it tears, um, neither of which is good and if you don't fix it soon, you uh, end up with an eye that doesn't see. Early on, when I was a resident, I saw a patient who Tom Auberg had done a vitrectomy on, and she had diabetes, and uh, she'd been blind for uh, about 17 years due to a severe hemorrhage in her eye that had never cleared. And Tom did a vitrectomy procedure on her. And postoperatively, as things just, just started to clear, started to heal after the surgery, she saw her 16-year-old son for the first time. And uh, I think this was something that had a tremendous effect on everybody that was involved in, the, in her care. It was new. It was exciting. It was the beginning of something that you knew, or at least I knew, this is going to be big. This is going to have major impact, not only on medicine as a whole, it's going to have major impact on individual patients' lives. It was almost paralyzing when I realized what was going on with his vision because it kept happening over and over and over again. Imagine you were trying to look through a glass with half water, half uh, oil in it. Shake it up. You know, all the little beady, little air pockets in there. Trying to look through it. You cannot do it. And we're talking about a strong man, you know, who's, you know, the head of the family and you know, prideful, you know, he's kind of typical. And to see this happen to him, it, you know, and I remember calling my son one day and saying that, you know, your dad may go blind. And it just, it just blew my mind. I, I just could not handle it. I had to get a hold of things and think more positive. If it was going on un untreated, I can be totally blind right now. It really saved much of my sight. Prior to the development of, of vitreous surgery, uh, patients with, uh, for example, severe injuries to the eyes, uh, other than being able to just simply close the wound and hope that the eye would heal itself, there was really nothing that could be done. 
And the only way to fix it in most cases is to take out whatever is pulling the vitreous or and get rid of whatever is stopping the, the vision and that would be the blood. And that's essentially what you're doing with vitrectomy. Three small little incisions or openings are made in the white part of the eye. And we put three little instruments into the inside of the eye. Once the vitreous and the cloudy fluid have been removed, then we can more extensively examine the eye, find the source of the bleeding, a broken blood vessel as an example, treat it with a laser beam that we have inserted in the eye in place of the vitrectomy instrument, take the instruments out, sew up the little holes if they need to be sewn up, but frequently they are self-sealing, put a bandage on the eye, and send the patient out to get ready to go home with hopefully a good prognosis for much improved vision. The name of the uh, instruments used during vitret surgery were, was first the, the VIS called Vitreous Infusion Suction Cutter. The development of all vitreoretinal surgery uh, with the VIS started with Dr. Mockamer, Bob Mockamer, and uh, he then had a, a team of essentially four people, uh, Helmut Butner uh, and John Marie Perel, who was a uh, biomedical engineer, and then Tom Alberg, who was one of his first fellows. And they, they learned the procedure. Uh, they, they taught the procedure to many other people. And as the procedure developed, uh, they found out that it could treat more than diabetic blind eyes. There are very few people that come along in one's lifetime that you get to know who are not only great mentors, uh, wise in their ways that you trust and who just have a wonderful empathy for the feelings of patients and students. Robert Mockamer epitomized all of those characteristics. Robert Mockamer came up with the idea of vitrectomy as a natural extension of his interest in trying to find ways of repairing retinal detachment. Robert Markhamer called and said, Helmut, you got to come over. I just did something very exciting. An egg was standing, a raw egg, which the, the uh, top had been removed, and into this opening of the shell, into the white of the egg, he had introduced the tip of the drill that was surrounded by this metal sleeve and held that in his hand. He then activated, uh, turned on the drill, and through the rotating action, the white of the egg was cut and extruded up on the top of the sleeve. And uh, that, uh, he said, see, that's exactly what, uh, what we need to do in the, inside the eye with, uh, uh, to cut the vitreous fibrils and the vitreous gel. Robert uh, and I stayed in close contact, and he called and said um, that he had the, the new equipment for doing the vitrectomy work, and it was called a VISC, V-I-S-C, 2, VISC 2. VISC 1 was one that he had just used in an eggshell, and that was just purely just to get the concept down. Dr. Mockmer was very much a team player, although he was very definitely the captain of the team. He was also an individual who was very willing to share what he knew and consistently found new ideas, different ideas, from people he was sharing his information with. He said, what's your name? And I, to I told him who I was. And he says, what do you have under your arm? And I says, those are my books. Can I see them? Yeah. And I show him the instrument that I had not only designed, but also built in Australia to do actually vitreous cutting. It was the only microsurgical instrument in existence at the time. He brought me to his office and he asked me what all of these tips were, the thing that goes inside the eye, and I told him. And he complained that that one 
wasn't catting, his was not catting. And he asked me, how come yours could cat? And so I explained. There is tension between the blade, like in a pair of scissors. So every time the machine turns, it actually cuts like a scissor. So it was about lunchtime. He says, are you hungry? And we started to talk about how we could collaborate. And everything was done on, on you know, the napkins. <laughs> the first pars planet attracted me. Uh, the man who had not seen, had not had any useful vision for many, many years suddenly could see 2070 and could even read the larger print in a newspaper. That You can imagine how excited he was, and he did not hide his, his excitement. You know. When Dr. Machmer first started doing vitreous surgery, the people he trained to do vitreous surgery were younger people because the ability to develop the skill to do this delicate surgery really depended upon a certain amount of agility and stamina and willingness to try things new. And that was a little different than the traditional hierarchy in medicine in which something new, something creative would be allocated to the older boss of the organization, if you will. In the old days, only the <clears throat> daredevil vitreal retinal surgeon would touch it. So you could count them on two hands. 1972, about that many. By 80, I would say every person trained in the state, in the US, had training in vitreal retinal surgery. When we first started doing vitrectomies, there were lots of problems. Many of the problems were related to selection of the patients that might benefit, because often our ability to see in the eye and to understand what was hidden behind that bloody vitreous was no better than the patient's ability to see out of the eye. The second biggest problem was just in the equipment itself. It started off with very crude equipment that was not very reliable, not very sharp, broke down a lot, so we had lots of mechanical problems. And then the big problem is how do you get light in to see adequately? And uh, with all the surfaces of the contact lens and the cornea, and the incident light was competing with the reflecting light, and that of course degraded the image quality tremendously and uh, just getting enough illumination into the eye that you could see what you were doing was a big problem. We built the vitreo microscope, a, mi a microscope specifically for that type of surgery. And it's a combination of all of that that made the procedure successful. And this required a very close collaboration between the physics engineers, and the clinician. Every maneuver in that surgical procedure that is taught today, whether it's vit red or cataract surgery, and every instrument has a story behind it. And, and many times our, our young people we're training don't really have time to understand the, the basis of, well, why was this instrument developed? Most people probably live their lives without ever having an opportunity, privilege, of really discovering something that has a profound effect on lots and lots of other people. Vitreous surgery gave us that opportunity. What I knew was that if we were successful, then we would make blind patients see. You can buy anything. Right? But having a blind patient and the patient walks out and gives you his white cane, how often did that happen to you? It happened to me. That was the best gift 